"'It's mother,' Dickon said again when they met halfway. "'I know thou wanted to see her, and I told her where the door was hid.' Colin held out his hand with a sort of flushed royal shyness, but his eyes quite devoured her face. "'Even when I was ill I wanted to see you,' he said. "'You and Dickon and the secret garden. I'd never wanted to see anyone or anything before.' The sight of his uplifted face brought about a sudden change in her own. She flushed, and the corners of her mouth shook, and a mist seemed to sweep over her eyes. "'Eh, dear lad,' she broke out tremulously, "'eh, dear lad,' as if she had not known she was going to say it. She did not say Mr. Colin, but just dear lad, quite suddenly. She might have said it to Dickon in the same way, if she had seen something in his face which touched her. Colin liked it. "'Are you surprised because I am so well?' he asked. She put her hand on his shoulder, and smiled the mist out of her eyes. "'Ay, that I am,' she said. "'But thou art so like thy mother, that made my heart jump.' "'Do you think,' said Colin a little awkwardly, "'that will make my father like me?' "'Ay, for sure, dear lad,' she answered, and she gave his shoulder a soft, quick pat. "'He mun come home. He mun come home.' "'Susan Sowerby,' said Bud Motherstaff, getting close to her, Look at the lad's legs, wilt tha? They was like drumsticks a stock in two month ago, and I heard folk tell us they was bandy and knock-kneed both at the same time. Look at em now. Susan Sowerby laughed a comfortable laugh. They're going to be fine, strong lad's legs in a bit, she said. Let him go on playing and working in the garden and eating hearty and drinking plenty of good sweet milk and there'll not be a finer pair in Yorkshire, thank God for it. She put both hands on Mistress Mary's shoulders, and looked her little face over in a motherly fashion. And thee, too, she said, thou'rt grown near as hearty as our Elizabeth Ellen. I'll warrant thou'rt like thy mother, too. Our Martha told me, as Mrs. Medlock heard, she was a pretty woman. Thou'lt be like a blush rose when thou grows up, my little lass, bless thee. She did not mention that when Martha came home on her day out and described the plain, sallow child she had said that she had no confidence whatever in what Mrs. Medlock had heard. It doesn't stand to reason that a pretty woman could be the mother of such a foul little lass, she had added obstinately. Mary had not had time to pay much attention to her changing face. She had only known that she looked different and seemed to have a great deal more hair and that it was growing very fast. But remembering her pleasure in looking at the Mem Sahib in the past, she was glad to hear that she might some day look like her. Susan Sowerby went round their garden with them, and was told the whole story of it, and shown every bush and tree which had come alive. Colin walked on one side of her, and Mary on the other. Each of them kept looking up at her comfortable, rosy face, secretly curious about the delightful feeling she gave them, a sort of warm, supported feeling. It seemed as if she understood them as Dickon understood his creatures. She stooped over the flowers and talked about them as if they were children. Soot followed her and once or twice caught at her and flew upon her shoulder as if it were Dickens. When they told her about the robin and the first flight of the young ones, she laughed a motherly little mellow laugh in her throat. I suppose learning em to fly is like learning children to walk. "'But I'm feared I should be all in a worrit if mine had wings instead of legs,' she said. It was because she seemed such a wonderful woman in her nice moorland cottage way that at last she was told about the magic. "'Do you believe in magic?' asked Colin after he had explained about Indian fakirs. "'I do hope you do.' "'That I do, lad,' she answered. "'I never knowed it by that name, but what does the name matter?' I warrant they call it a different name in France and a different one in Germany. The same thing is set the seeds swelling and the sun shining made thee a well lad, and it's the good thing. It isn't like us poor fools as think it matters if us is called out of our names. The big good thing doesn't stop to worry, bless thee. It goes on making worlds by the million, worlds like us. Never thee stop believing in the big good thing, and knowing the world's full of it. And call it what thou likes. Thou wert singing to it when I come into the garden. I felt so joyful, said Colin, opening his beautiful strange eyes at her. Suddenly I felt how different I was, how strong my arms and legs were, you know, and how I could dig and stand, and I jumped up and wanted to shout out something to anything that would listen. The magic listened when thou sung the doxology. 
It would have listened to anything that sung. It was the joy that mattered. Eh,、hey, lad, lad, what's names to the joy maker? And she gave his shoulders a quick, soft pat again. She had packed a basket which held a regular feast this morning, and when the hungry hour came and Dickon brought it out from its hiding place, she sat down with them under the tree and watched them devour their food, laughing and quite gloating over their appetites. She was full of fun and made them laugh at all sorts of odd things. She told them stories in broad Yorkshire and taught them new words. She laughed as if she could not help it when they told her of the increasing difficulty there was in pretending that Colin was still a fretful invalid. "You see, we can't help laughing nearly all the time when we are together," explained Colin, "and it doesn't sound ill at all. We try to choke it back, but it will burst out, and that sounds worse than ever." "There's one thing that comes into my mind so often," said Mary, "and I can scarcely ever hold in when I think of it suddenly." I keep thinking. Suppose Colin's face should get to look like a full moon. It isn't like one yet, but he gets a tiny bit fatter every day. And suppose some morning it should look like one. What should we do? Bless us all! I can see that has a good bit of play acting to do," said Susan Sowerby. "But that won't have to keep it up much longer. Mister Craven'll come home. Do you think he will?" asked Colin. "Why?" Susan Sowerby chuckled softly. I suppose it'd nigh break thy heart if he found out before thou told him in thy own way," she said. "Thou's laid awake nights plannin' it." "I couldn't bear anyone else to tell him," said Colin. "I think about different ways every day. I think now I just want to run into his room." "That'd be a fine start for him," said Susan Sowerby. "I'd like to see his face, lad. I would that. He mun come back. That he mun." One of the things they talked of was the visit they were to make to her cottage. They planned it all. They were to drive over the moor and lunch out of doors among the heather. They would see all the twelve children in Dickens' garden and would not come back until they were tired. Susan Sowerby got up at last to return to the house and Mrs. Medlock. It was time for Colin to be wheeled back also, but before he got into his chair, he stood quite close to Susan and fixed his eyes on her with a kind of bewildered adoration. And he suddenly caught hold of the fold of her blue cloak and held it fast. "You are just what I, what I wanted," he said. "I wish you were my mother as well as Dickens." All at once, Susan Sowerby bent down and drew him with her warm arms close against the bosom under the blue cloak, as if he had been Dickens' brother. The quick mist swept over her eyes. "Eh,、hey, dear lad," she said. Thy own mother is in this ere very garden, I do believe. She couldn't a keep out of it. Thy father mun come back to thee. He mun.